Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Les Norford. I teach in the Building Technology Program in the Department of Architecture, and it's a, a great pleasure for me to, to welcome Katrine Klingenberger, who's happy to be called Kat, to the uh, um, MIT campus and to introduce her um, to you. Um, there's a little bit of history I'd like to um, um, give before she gets started. Uh, um, the idea of low energy houses in the, uh, in the US had uh, um, its, its uh, birth, if you will, in, in the early 1970s, uh, in the aftermath of, uh, of the first oil shocks. And in fact, it started uh, um, um, partly in New England when the Harvard-educated physicist uh, William Shercliffe and a local builder, Gene Ledger, built very low energy, super insulated, or so-called double envelope houses. Um, but as the prices came down after the, uh, the spikes, interest waned in that, and, and, uh, and it took the Germans to rescue it sometime later and, and kind of codify what would be required for low energy houses as the passive house concept and the, uh, the passive house um, standard. Um, Kat, who's uh, educated as an architect in her native Germany and then later in the US, um, Kind of was responsible uh, in large part for its renaissance here by building a passive house in, in, uh, in central uh, Illinois. And that was 1,400 square feet, and it had two to three times as much insulation as, as codes at the time required. The best windows in North America she could get her hands on. Um, a ventilation system uh, imported from Germany, as I recall, uh, that would carefully bring in air, bypassing the very tightly sealed envelope, and then recover uh, heat on the way out. And put all that together, and the, the, the peak demand for energy in, in, in wintertime in a, uh, a heating-dominated climate is about a watt a square foot. And, and for 1,400 square feet, that's about 2,000 watts. And for calibration, my little prop here, a home hair dryer. And if you come up afterwards, you peer in there, you see about four coils of nichrome wire. That's 1,875 watts. So there's your heating system for, uh, um, um, for, uh, for her house. So she not only built a house, but she, she built a movement. The year that house was finished, she, she founded the, uh, um, the Passive House Institute uh, US and, and is its uh, um, executive director, co-director. Uh, today and so for the last 15 years she's uh, um, she's done that and she co-authored the, the the standards the passive house I get the title right here uh, climate response uh, specific passive house building standards passive building standards and and the climate specific is important because this recognizes in North America there's a wide range of climates and what you require of a building varies with climate in order to meet kind of performance targets on energy consumption or uh, or, or say occupancy and comfort. And, and she also recognized the need to, to get out of a sort of a, a one-off sort of thing and, and ally herself with, with uh, entities that could help mainstream this technology. And so these standards have been developed with help of, uh, or at least not awareness of, well, in collaboration with the US Department of Energy and its Building America program. And as a warning, if you don't do this, you end up with what we were talking about earlier, which is solar ovens in the middle of the Canadian prairie in, um, um, in, um, in wintertime. Okay. Um, she'll talk more about the standards, but they're, they're a pretty remarkable combination of, of dealing with integrity of buildings, the economics of what makes sense, more in the building envelope, less on equipment, and some attention to global carbon budgets and, and our kind of global responsibility to do something about that. So she, uh, in addition to her executive uh, role in, 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 in FIAS, uh, um, she's involved in uh, um, building passive houses, consulting on them, uh, leading an education effort to, to uh, certify uh, other consultants to carry forward uh, um, this work, and directing the, uh, the research programs of FIAS. She re remains a licensed architect in Germany, and she's learned a huge amount in the last 15 years about what works and doesn't work, at what scale, um, at what cost. And so she'll, she's happy to share uh, um, a lot of those uh, experiences and lessons with us today. So please join me in, in welcoming her to, to MIT. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Can, can you hear me all right? All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much for such a kind introduction. And um, uh, I uh, do no longer have to go into the history. <laughs> this is a great, great summary. And we can uh, jump right uh, into our presentation here. 
But before I do that, I like to say a few words about the slide right here. And some of you who uh, have read the abstract that was on the flyer for this presentation. Uh, tonight, uh, you uh, noticed that I was going to talk about low rise and mid rise, and this is clearly a high rise. So um, the good news here is that uh, this is a little bit of a glimpse into the future. Where are we today with passive buildings, pass passive building standards? Uh, how far have we come to implement them in the United States? And uh, we're now seeing affordable high rises on the drawing boards that are supposed to break ground next year sometime. And this particular project is actually uh, developed by a developer from Boston, Trinity Financial, and uh, it will be built in the Bronx in New York City. So very exciting stuff happening, and uh, a lot of folks now have awareness, again, about passive buildings, passive building standards, and the benefits of them. And um, I like to uh, go into uh, the context here and the trends with you first, uh, before we uh, get into the uh, principles and standards a little bit and the lessons learned. And then I like to wrap up with um, new frontiers that we see as the next challenge on the path to further develop our tools and standards uh, on the path to a um, carbon neutral built environment. Uh, maybe also before I talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, infrared shot here, right? Um, really quick, uh, the, uh, in, the Passive House Institute US that we f uh, was founded in 2003 as a nonprofit housing development organization. And that is actually how we started with very small buildings initially. And then the Department of Energy took notice and then it, it went from there. In 2007, we retooled our focus from community housing development towards uh, certification of projects, quality assurance uh, to help the market transform, educate the professional sector and also do research to, again, better our tools that we had at the time and to further develop these standards to better meet our goals. Um, the goals of the passive building standards, as uh, Leslie mentioned, one big element here is to uh, create a built environment that we basically can take off of the planetary carbon bill, uh, trying to decarbonize the built environment. That is really the one main focus of the whole effort here, um, amongst uh, uh, quite a few others. But that, that is really the most pressing for me, at least personally. Uh, so one quick comment to uh, the infrared shot right here. This is the uh, Genie Gang's uh, Aqua Tower in Chicago. And uh, we uh, had our office right across from the building for a couple of years. And uh, so I walked past it every morning. And at some point, I, I, I had this vision of this infrared shot in my head. And I'm just like, this is a building that is driving past the speed limit, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you see what I'm saying. It's like we, we have buildings that are not healthy for the planet, and we are OK with it. So uh, in my opinion, really, we, we, we need to um, come up with a solution to curb the carbon emissions in our built environment. And this infrared shot really shows the problem quite directly. Um, we were joking about it. It looks like a radiator plugged into ComEd in Illinois. <laughs> And that's not the only building, and it is a brand new building on top of everything else, right? So we, we have an issue here. All right, let's jump right in. I don't think we have to talk about this very much. Uh, we know the climate is changing. Uh, you guys right here in Boston are right on the front edge of it. I just saw an article that a sunny day flooding is increasing much sooner than scientists had expected. I didn't know that term. I looked it up. It was basically tidal flooding. Uh, so we are, we are advancing in this uh, change process much faster than we had initially um, uh, kind of thought. So uh, I believe we, we need to really speed up our efforts here. Um, Leslie already mentioned uh, the whole energy efficiency discussion. Uh, this is not a new thing. Passive House is not a German concept originally. Um, it was really uh, a response to the uh, energy crisis, oil embargo, in 1973 that the Department of Energy uh, here in the US, as well as the counterpart in Canada, started to fund significant research into uh, energy efficiency in buildings and how we could get away from using a lot of fossil fuels in our buildings. And um, a lot of the principles that I'm going to uh, discuss with you here and show you here in a second uh, they were already very much codified. If you read William Shercliffe and uh, the fellow researchers of the time, uh, Rob Dumont uh, from Canada, Harold Orr, uh, you will find those passive principles already outlined pretty much almost identical as we, we uh, describe them today, uh, which is uh, quite, quite amazing. 
Uh, in the 1970s, also the first energy codes were um, uh, authored and then have developed over the years. You can see right here for a long time, not that much happened. Um, but then in 2005, uh, this is five, five right here, we see a significant effort even here in the United States to tighten the energy codes. So uh, we are doing all right with our energy codes, uh, International Energy Conservation Code 2012, 2015. Uh, but uh, to get to the passive building standards where we would meet our global carbon reductions in the built environment, this is still a pretty significant jump. So we're talking about something here that is really a significant paradigm shift in building design, not just like tightening numbers or targets. Uh, it's a different design process that we have to uh, employ to get there. So uh, as Leslie mentioned, uh, we partnered very early on in our development of these standards with the Department of Energy. Uh, uh, we had started out initially uh, using the German standard. That's what I used to design my house in uh, uh, Urbana in Illinois. And we learned uh, quite a few lessons along the way. Uh, one of the most significant lessons was uh, probably a project in uh, New Orleans in uh, Louisiana. And at that point, we were really obviously in a cooling dominated climate and, and we started to realize that there's more to it than just like a, a one target that can lead us to the ideal optimization of the envelope. We had to rethink the, the standards based on climate. But uh, the partnership with the Zero Energy Ready Home Program and the Department of Energy was aiming at um, a similar effort. We were also trying to uh, harmonize with in accepted industry practices and best building science practices that the Department of Energy already very well described and very well codified. So we partnered with, the Res uh, with ResNet, the Residential Energy Network, and uh, incorporated a very strict on-site quality assurance protocol as well into our certification. Uh, because another lesson learned, <laughs> if you don't validate and verify on-site what you specify in the drawings, it might not get built. And that is a big part of the equation. So you can see right here the DOE uh, staircase for energy efficiency, uh, various programs, 2009 IECC, uh, that's still the Building America baseline. I have this in here because the numbers on the next slide refer to that one. But then the next best uh, uh, energy star, a 3.1 program, then one level up, a zero energy ready home. And then after that, we have a co-promotion agreement with the zero energy ready home program. Next level up that they recommend is FIAS Plus. And most recently, we also added a source zero certification because, again, our goal must be to get to zero carbon. So uh, that is that. Um, to give you an idea what the energy savings are that we are looking at here under the FIAS Plus program, um, we uh, used the 2009 IECC baseline because that is the Building America baseline. The new standards were uh, created under a Department of Energy grant. So you can see up here, actually, in fact, I was supposed to use this green pointer. Like this is uh, the uh, average heating load, uh, heating demand reduction uh, nationwide throughout all different climates that the standards are achieving. Uh, compared to the 2009 IECC and then 46 for the cooling demand, you can see there's quite a bit of a discrepancy there, right? Uh, so lesson learned here is that uh, reducing cooling via passive measures is quite a bit harder than uh, reducing heating, uh, which works very well in cold climates. So again, this is one of those lessons learned transferred from Central Europe that is heating dominated and almost no cooling to climates that have uh, both heating and cooling. But in general, uh, that's what we're looking for right here to meet our carbon reduction targets in the built environment. And again, that goes back to a calculation based on how much carbon we still can afford to burn on the planet and um, how much then that would mean we have to reduce per square foot in the, uh, in the built environment. Okay, one, oh la la, now I'm going too fast. Um, also worth mentioning that um, the uh, passive building targets that we're working with right now are actually quite well aligned with other zero energy efforts and programs. So here, the uh, 2030 uh, challenge brought forward by Ed Rio. Uh, and uh, if you apply passive building targets today, you're already somewhat ahead of schedule. 
you're already building a shell that then is at about 80% of the target, and that is mostly before PV. So this is really all um, happening because of the application of better improvement in the envelope. And uh, to give you an idea where we're at today with passive building standards and certifications, um, this is uh, the development right here. Uh, this is starting in 2009. This is when we uh, officially started our certification uh, program in the United States. Uh, we have some graphs that still go all the way over here <laughs> to uh, when I built my house. So it took quite a while. That was in 2003. So you can see it took us, it took us uh, quite some time and uh, uh, some persistence and uh, sticking with it. Um, but then in 2013, a little drop here in 2014, uh, especially with the arrival of the new climate-specific cost-optimized passive building standards, we're starting to see a nice trend developing here in terms of like uh, exponential uh, growth in the certification sector. Um, there are still uh, some uh, European uh, projects uh, as well, uh, some consultants who use the European standards, so those are both currently in the market and there's a little bit of a confusion out there. Um, this is the uh, level of certifications that the European Passive House uh, Institute in Darmstadt is at right now. And you can see, like after 2015, it really started to kind of flatten out. And there's a reason. Uh, the new standards are more cost optimized. They are more climate appropriate. They are less prone to overheating. Uh, and they are really trying to get to the sweet spot between conservation and generation while taking the cost of PV into account. And I'll show you this in a second how we did this. Now, uh, only FIAS certifications by themselves right now. There's really good news. So we always, beginning of the year, we set like our target and we project. We're generally very conservative. Um, and uh, this year, it looks like we're already uh, on target to very much exceed this projection. Uh, in April, we had already certified as many projects as we had in all of 2017. So we're way ahead of schedule. Um, now you might be wondering, oh, too fast again, sorry about that. Uh, so, and all these projects, they are now really starting to be in all different climate zones. And we are also seeing all different kind of um, uh, building typologies here. Initially, it was only single family projects. And that was really because it was um, uh, individual builders who saw an opportunity. They built those spec houses. They brought in lo uh, local uh, policy folks and started to create uh, interest in, um, uh, and, and, and gain client, clients from it and then built their business that way. And then eventually, uh, it moved into multifamily construction, and then from there into commercial and, and larger construction as well. And now we are even seeing uh, government and school buildings as well. OK, so uh, most of these projects, though, the heavy lift, uh, most of the units and the square footage really comes from affordable housing developments right now. And um, that seems to be somewhat a sweet spot where these standards can uh, very easily be attained at a fairly low additional cost. And there's a reason for that. I'll talk about this in a second. Um, these are various projects around the country right here. Again, this is not low rise and mid rise. But uh, this is a project in Portland, um, Oregon, uh, one of the first ones. This is New York City. This is a retrofit in Washington, DC. So you can see they, they are happening pretty much everywhere. This is Maine, uh, Portland. Uh, this is Eugene uh, in Oregon. This is Pittsburgh. This is uh, another Hillsboro, Portland, Oregon project. A couple more New York projects right here. And, and this is really just <laughs> the tip of the iceberg. We have now over 80 projects uh, in certification. And I heard a number which I still wanted to verify with the office, so don't, don't hold me to it. But I believe somebody said the other day 50, 50 multifamily projects in New York City alone. So uh, that speaks to the next slide, but give me a second. I want to explain uh, this uh, down here real quick. So uh, just to give you an idea where these projects come in at, um, if you look at them from a point of view of uh, EUI, energy use index here, um, the site EUI varies from 10 to 25 kBTUs per square foot in a year. And the reason why there's this big spread is because, um, first of all, climate. Um, in, again, in a, a cooling-dominated climate, it is not as easy to bring the EUI down by passive measures. 
uh, but it also varies based on building typology. It is uh, much easier to get a better EUI for a smaller building than for a larger building because relatively speaking, multifamily projects are already somewhat efficient. The uh, really inefficient ones are the single family um, buildings that we, that we construct. So there, there's a little bit of a range there, but most of the, and this is really the, the high end, most multifamily projects come in at, at about 20, uh, I'd say. And um, again, this speaks here to the point that I made earlier, uh, the zero energy ready home program that is kind of like uh, always the benchmark that we're measuring ourselves against. Uh, the 50% better against uh, the, the zero energy ready home program, that happens in Alaska, in cold climate, where we have high um, savings potential through passive measures. And then in Houston, Texas, it's down to 20. Again, uh, cooling is not as easily done. So this all wouldn't be happening by itself, of course. Um, we have seen significant uh, will shown by municipalities and by housing finance agencies. And these are, again, just the tip of the iceberg that are uh, a whole bunch more of the housing finance agencies that have signed on across the country and that are now incentivizing uh, passive buildings in one way or another. Some are very direct. They say you get 10 points if you build to passive building standards and you move right up to the front of the line and therefore you are most competitive. Some just uh, do it more as an encouragement, we, 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 uh, pet, we, we move, we encourage you to do it, but we don't necessarily give you points for it. But um, uh, most significantly uh, in, in regards to um, policy making, I'd say New York City really is on the front line. They passed an actual bill that has written source energy targets of passive into that bill for all capital buildings. Uh, they are still like, trying to figure out what exactly that means, but they are definitely on that path. They have started to use passive building standards as a means to meet their climate action plan. And uh, there, there will be more to follow. And also Massachusetts, where is it? Up here? <laughs> uh, two years ago, actually uh, wrote passive building standards into the uh, energy code as an alternative <coughs> compliance path which is a, a really great first step. So there's a lot of motion in the policy and, and code area uh, as well to incentivize these standards. And uh, yes, of course, uh, City of Vancouver also, um, they, they are very far ahead. They, are, they, they have started to provide zoning, and zoning incentives uh, in addition to, uh, to other incentives as well. All right, so very quickly, um, this, uh, here are a couple um, affordable projects that were successfully built and that have been uh, occupied now for quite a while. Uh, the first one up here that you're seeing, the um, hill of the uh, orchards at Orenco phase one, that still used the old targets from Europe. So this is a really great kind of like proof of concept for us because we had the opportunity to see the standards play out right side by side. And uh, in uh, Oregon, actually, that climate is fairly similar compared to Central Europe. Uh, so that was a great way to see. And then the second phase, uh, the developer actually said, like, ah, oh, this was too expensive. This is great. We, we believe in this stuff. We are going to value engineer the next phase. And we just don't have an additional grant to finance those additional uh, upfront costs. And you can see right here, the phase one cost them 11% over their baseline. And that was, that was quite high. So they, they uh, could not really justify that. And then uh, that was when we came out with the new FIAS Plus 2015 cost optimized standard. And uh, we offered them to uh, calculate their value engineered project. And it turned out that it was an almost exact match. They had to do only very small upgrades. And they said, like, well, great. We're doing it again. We, we're going for certification. And those cost optimizations led to basically, um, what is it, 8% uh, less. So above like uh, approximately a 5% additional premium. Now, that can be explained quite a bit also by significant cost increase in, in the Northwest. You might have heard they have significant housing uh, crisis in terms of not enough units. So construction is very expensive. While they are trying to get the cost down for passive, they also had to uh, combat um, significant increases in the construction market itself. 
But in general, with most of the, uh, all, of, all of the FIAS Plus projects now going forward, we have seen very consistent, great performance. They are consistently billed at like about 1% to 2% additional cost now, which is, of course, what we were hoping for. And so we're very happy that these numbers are coming in at that level. Uh, this is uh, the Hillcrest project here that was for a second the largest one in the country and then got surpassed by another mid-rise. Uh, also great performance, about 2% um, above their baseline uh, here. And then what good are performance standards if you don't meet them when you measure the actual performance, right? So uh, our uh, tool, our modeling tool is an energy prediction. Uh, we are now finally getting uh, actual measured results back from these first projects that have been occupied for one or two years now. And uh, this is the first uh, uh, Oregon project right here where you can see that the yellow line, this was actually our uh, modeled prediction, and the green line is what we measured uh, after uh, one year. Uh, there's also a line right here, this red line. This is the European standard. And uh, we can't really go into the details why the discrepancy is here, but um, just uh, to explain that real quick, there are modeling protocol differences between the two standards. And they, mostly the climate-specific standards versus non-climate-specific standards, and those modeling protocols, they cause this uh, discrepancy, which leads to a significant over-prediction in the European model um, in regards to performance. So again, we are very happy with this. Uh, in this bar chart right here, we over-predicted uh, this performance by about 2%, and that's where we would like to be. That's not always the case on all projects. There's a little bit of variation, but what we've seen so far, we're within minus plus or minus 10%. Uh, we're trying to calibrate, given those numbers that we're getting back, we are recalibrating our model and trying to get better and getting it to get it into the like minus 5% plus or minus 5% bracket. All right, that takes us to the paradigm shift in how we think about designing these buildings. Um, we have partnered with the uh, Fraunhofer Institute for Building Physics to build a new uh, state-of-the-art modeling tool uh, designed specifically for uh, passive buildings, very low load buildings uh, in different climates. And uh, it's a uh, whole building energy uh, balancing tool that uh, can take all these different uh, aspects here into account. Uh, of course, uh, weather data, climate, air exchange, inner load, set points, HVAC, all that that goes into the overall um, energy calculations. And in addition to that, it can also uh, calculate uh, dynamically uh, the conditions of um, a wall assembly for example. So it can model basically using uh, hourly data if there's going to be any potential of condensation in your wall assembly depending on what kind of materials you're using in that wall assembly and which climate you're in. So it is a very powerful tool that uh, has a lot of opportunity for granularity and that's what we like. Um, the, um, so these are the principles here, essentially, that are being applied in passive building design. As I mentioned before, uh, some of them were already codified during the first years uh, in the US and Canada in the 70s. So uh, super insulation, uh, continuous insulation around the entire envelope, thermal bridge free design, airtight construction, uh, heat recovery ventilation, uh, and uh, also uh, very good window components. Those uh, principles were already right there. And those are the ones that then were uh, transported to, to Europe and the Europeans picked up on those. Um, when we started re-implementing uh, those passive building standards in uh, 2003 and um, built our affordable homes, we found very quickly that of course shading and daylighting is a big uh, issue in more mixed climates and also um, the more dyna dynamic kind of part of the circle of the design. Uh, how does the envelope interact with the HVAC system, uh, hydrothermal storage and uh, thermal storage? Those are all uh, elements that are much better calculated in an hourly energy model, 
uh, these top level elements, they can be still fairly easily and quickly calculated in a static simplified model. For design purposes, that's a really great fast feedback tool. But when it comes to more like hygrothermal performance of the envelope, moisture performance and comfort checks in your buildings, you really want the ability to be able to switch to a dynamic model. And that's what this uh, model is doing for us. So once you employ these, let's say, five strategies and 10 tactics correctly, uh, y your result is a, a building that is very comfortable and healthy, of course. The durability is very high. It will last a long time. Uh, it is uh, cost effective, uh, efficient, and uh, best of all, maybe it is also resilient because it is a very low load building. It now can actually coast through power outages as well. So um, that all said, so those are the principles, um, strategies that we employ in designing passive buildings. They are different from the standards themselves. So now we're going to start to talk about these standards, uh, which are essentially design parameters that guide us how to employ these principles to get to the optimal uh, point between conservation generation and building design. So a passive building standard uh, is uh, char characterized by essentially um, kind of like a design process of three steps. First, you have design parameters that guide you to design your space conditioning, heating and cooling. These, this is basically optimization of the, the envelope itself. Uh, and then uh, you have a source energy criterion, a budget design parameter for your overall energy usage in the building, not just space conditioning, heating and cooling. And that overall total energy budget is essentially your equivalent um, carbon uh, indicator, if you will. And then um, we also have an air tightness criterion that uh, is there to um, make sure that the building envelope is very well constructed and will last long and there will be no condensation. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's an additional certification and that is the source zero, which is based on the baseline certification that I was just going through. Okay, so when it comes to climates, it's getting really uh, challenging because standards actually, they, as I said before, uh, if you are in a, um, a solely heating dominated climate like uh, in Germany, the conditions are fairly simple. Uh, you do not have to balance heating versus cooling. If you go to the United States where you have uh, much greater uh, temperature differentials, uh, you very quickly get into zones where the climate is somewhat mixed. You have heating and cooling, and you have even dehumidification on top of it. Uh, all those conditions, uh, they start to impact where, these, where the sweet spot is that you should design to. Uh, for example, if you uh, in a, a heating-dominated climate, insulation is fantastic, right? It does a great job to reduce um, your, your heating demand, but uh, in a cooling dominated climate, it starts to work against you. So those, those standards need to be set in conjunction with each other. They need to be calibrated. Um, and that's exactly what we did in our studies uh, with the Department of Energy, with Building Science Corporation, when we created the climate-specific passive building standards. So some of you might have seen, used the uh, BIOT model from uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory right here. It's a very powerful building energy optimization tool that starts with, again, this 2009 IACC Building America baseline. And then uh, based on whatever the next lowest hanging fruit is, it, it picks the uh, improvement uh, into the envelope and systems until it starts, uh, the uh, measures become too expensive and it starts to push back up into diminishing returns. And um, of course, all this is being calibrated uh, with an eye towards zero. So a uh, cost of uh, photovoltaic is taken into account in this optimization process. Uh, this process led us to the conclusion that not just one number for heating or one number for cooling is sufficient. We need different numbers to guide the design to the best uh, results in any climate. So that means you need a different number for the heating demand, for the heating load. So not just demand, but also load is required. Uh, and the same is true for cooling and for, uh, cooling, for cooling demand and cooling load. And everything varies. So all these uh, values vary. 
We have our air tightness criterion. Again, this is our quality uh, assurance. And then we have our final total uh, energy uh, kind of limit here. And in our case, it was 6,200 kilowatt hours per square meter uh, per person. I'm sorry. Uh, this is now uh, in the next version I'm going to talk about here in a second, uh, being dropped significantly to 3,840. So we are clearly uh, setting out to be on a path, on a glide path to zero. The latest by 2050, but I'm very, fairly certain that the tech committee will align with 2030 to get to zero by 2030. So this is a, a shot here from an uh, optimization case in the building energy optimization software from NREL for Chicago. You can see right here, this is the starting point for the 2009 uh, benchmark. And then the optimizer starts picking these lower hanging fruits, like this might be slab insulation, more insulation around the envelope, maybe this is an ERV. So uh, until it basically finds improvement, only improvements that are more expensive and that push back in, into diminishing returns, uh, that don't pay back through the savings. Um, this is pretty cool. You can program it in a way that it actually blips up here. This gray little blip tells us when PV starts to get cheaper than envelope improvements. And this little yellow blip here, that was actually solar thermal, which in almost all climates was uh, too expensive. That was interesting. We didn't expect that. So, uh, and again, in comparison here, the European standards that we started out with, and this explained why we found ourselves uh, with very high uh, additional costs in our initial projects, and also with over insulation in many cases, uh, it was uh, the European targets were not climate optimized, and they were pushing us up back too far into the diminishing returns, even to a point where the savings were no longer really justifying uh, the improvement. And this is how this looks like. So example of New York State. New York State is great. It has uh, climate data for uh, climate zone seven to four. I don't show seven here, only six. There's, I think, only one place in New York State that uh, is in climate zone seven. But here you can see how this plays out. So annual heating demand in zone six is seven. Annual cooling demand is 1.6. The peaks are clearly in the, the heating is dominant. Then as you go further south in five, it starts to get closer. Peaks are getting closer. And then as you go into like uh, climate zone four, uh, the two demands are almost, uh, not, now it's switching to uh, cooling dominated and uh, the cooling uh, load is also higher. So it makes perfect sense, right? And then here a couple even more lessons and they were really significant. And this is also a lesson learned uh, that explains why this is taking off in the multifamily sector right now. So the bigger the building, the easier it gets. Uh, if we go to the next slide right here, so we had the opportunity to work on two very drastically different projects in New York City. Uh, one was a Staten Island rebuild, a very tiny single family home that was even lifted off of the ground. So it was worst case scenario from a thermal perspective, uh, ambient air around the whole thing not very good surface to volume ratio, and we're working on a very large 250 unit multifamily project. Now look at the difference in our values uh, for the components right here, it is really significant. And that was just a feasibility study for the large multifamily project. We were not done with the final design, this was just a very rough kind of first stroke. Uh, once we were done with the optimization for that building, the wall, uh, our values were more very close much closer to code, like I think we ended up with an R20, 21 or so. Uh, roof came, I think that's code already, so it couldn't come down. <laughs> Slab uh, might have gone uh, away altogether, only perimeter insulation and an R5 windows, they, they are fine with. So we also learned the lesson that actually components are obviously climate specific, but they are also specific to building typology. Uh, when you run the energy model for a very large internal load dominated building, it's almost like as if that building lives in a warmer climate zone, um, it becomes cooling load dominated. And um, that meant that triple pane windows actually were keeping heat in. And the overall energy balance was better with a really, really good double pane window than it was with triple pane windows. So again, back to the sensitivity of overheating, uh, this is something the designer really has to develop a feel for and make sure that uh, the building is not uh, going to be uh, in danger of overheating. 
Then uh, also mechanical systems are building typology and climate specific, so ERV versus HRV, internal humidity loading, and very densely populated affordable housing developments. That's a big deal. Uh, you might end up with very high interior humidity levels in a climate where you generally might like an energy recovery ventilator to reject the humidity in the summer. But if you're producing a lot of humidity inside of the apartment, that can start to work against you. So uh, that all needs to be calibrated. And then, of course, also wall assemblies, depending on where your vapor control layer is in the wall, uh, you need to make sure that those layers are designed correctly based on the location um, in the country. All right, with all those lessons learned, we embarked on a, a new, um, uh, on the new version of uh, FIERS Plus. Uh, we essentially committed to a dynamic standard that has to be updated because cost changes. And uh, now you might think like, yeah, climate will change too. And uh, we will have to find a solution to that as well, like at least give people an option, uh, maybe take a little bit of a, a futuristic uh, view on which climate data you're going to use for your design, right? Um, and all these lessons learned that not only climate is important for standards, but also occupancy, density of the building, and also the typology. So basically, big buildings, better surface to volume ratio make a big difference. So uh, to all the architects in the room, I apologize. <laughs> These uh, buildings uh, are, that's the way how you draw in a BOP. It's not very pretty, uh, but it's really just to identify what, uh, window to wall ratio, and uh, it's, it's just, <laughs> just a diagram essentially. Um, so uh, instead of uh, basing our standard on one um, average 2,500 square foot home, which we did in the past, uh, assuming that anything that's bigger gets easier and the standards would be easily met. Now we're getting more granular. We're running the standards, or we're creating standards for the very small home that was almost impossible to build because the standards were too tough. Uh, we're doing the average small home project in the country and we have three different types of multifamily and uh, occupancy. And we ran all those now not for each and every climate zone as we did uh, for each and every uh, the spot that we had climate data for. But we ran those now initially only for, for the 17 ASHRAE climate zones. Um, we can do this. Like this. These climate zones track pretty well with heating degree days and cooling degree days. That said, when it comes to the peak, we have to do custom optimization still. So this is just for the pilot right now. Um, so we created a handy dandy little calculator that lives on our website. Uh, you can pick your climate zone out there. And then this, just as an example, you put in your floor area right here, uh, and then the occupancy right here, so 5B, let's say. And then you can see for a small building in this climate zone, you are heating dominated, and you're cooling, there's some, and here are your peaks. Now, if you go to a very big building in the same climate zone, 100,000 square feet, 200 people in it, you can see that the criteria flip. Make sense? So based on the typology and the occupancy, it is really critical that you have the right targets. Uh, they will inform your design. And um, the peak loads, this, this is good news right here, the peak loads are very, very close to each other for the system's design and, and very low. All right, so that's our pilot. And um, with that, I just very quickly wanna the heavy lifting is done and over. <laughs> All the theory about standards and principles. Uh, quickly look at a couple details here with you. Uh, again, that are the secret of the success, in my opinion. Uh, the community went out there and started building these projects. And what they found was we actually had all the technology that we needed. We don't have a technology problem. Uh, most of these projects are being built with market available components, including Windows. Um, and uh, people have been adopting uh, the details that they were normally using quite well by uh, taking into account continuous insulation, no thermal bridging, uh, a continuous airtight layer, vapor control layer, all like following the best building science practices and they are successful creating these projects. So in this particular case right here, uh, you can see this is an Oregon project. 
not totally thermally broken, but uh, if you do a condensation calculation here, um, then you will find that there's no risk of condensation due to that small little perimeter uh, thermal bridge, and that is okay. So uh, you don't have to go all the way around it. So people became very smart in kind of figuring out what the right amount of insulation is, what the right amount of thermal bridge avoidance is for these particular projects. But generally, very typical construction uh, techniques and materials. So this is a project here in, uh, uh, in Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, and that got a little fancier, and they had an interesting problem to solve. They had a cladding system, which of course comes with a whole bunch of like individual connections back to the structure. So they had a, a, a nice uh, thermal bridge problem uh, f created for themselves there, which I'll show you the solution here in a second. Um, air barrier design, at first everybody was very concerned about air barriers for these large projects, but turns out that these liquid uh, applied air barriers are actually uh, quite cost effective. Uh, they uh, fit well into the regular flow of construction. This is the actual sheathing right here. This is the project in Pittsburgh. And um, the actual structural sheathing, this is where the air barrier is being applied. And then there's an, a layer of continuous outboard mineral wool insulation on top of that. And um, the spray applied uh, uh, material is actually quite easy to check for defaults, uh, uh, for, I'm sorry, for, for mistakes, for uh, where you might have missed a spot. Uh, and uh, they have uh, achieved very good air tightness results with this, uh, with this method. That also is true for the design of the airtight layer. So uh, all consultants now, they are very diligent drawing the airtight layer continuously into the drawings. They even uh, additional drawing sets added to the construction set just for air tightness detailing, exact specifications, large scale, how the different materials connect to each other. And in this particular case is an example for how they s uh, changed their construction practices. Typically, they would run the wall up and have the parapet be connected, but to be able to assure that this is a continuous airtight layer right here, they interrupted the parapet, uh, made sure that the, in the airtight layer was continuous, and then attached the parapet uh, on top of that. Just an example how they solved it here in this particular case. Uh, larger buildings, uh, again, um, uh, liquid applied uh, air barriers. Uh, this one is a project here in Queens, 100-unit uh, mid-rise. Uh, ICFs, uh, insulated concrete forms, built in airtight layer in the structure itself. And then, of course, there are fancier approaches like prefabricated panels that have um, very intricate kind of uh, gasketing mechanisms that connect one panel to the next. Um, quite a little bit more high-tech here. And uh, again, this is the um, ICF project, and it doubles uh, its purpose. It's airtight and also is the continuous uh, insulation layer. And the feasibility study that I showed you earlier for the 250-story project in New York City, they are building it out of the same uh, construction material, also ICFs. So you can go quite high with, uh, with, that, with that technology. And then even for basic uh, Standard practices of concrete frame and um, even steel framing is possible. Just in that case, uh, we would say, like, don't even waste your time and insulate the steel studs. There's not enough insulation in the world to insulate steel, right? If you do the calculation, like those steel studs, if you insulated this, this would not be worth your money. Um, the R is reduced by, what, like uh, 40%. Um, so continuous, keep all the insulation on the outside, thermal bridge uh, free connectors right here. These are the Cascadia clips. And you get a nicely performing, continuously insulated wall assembly with pretty much fairly standard uh, construction practices. And then this is the solution here they came up with. This is the Pittsburgh project where they had the cladding system. Uh, if you actually do a calculation to meet passive building standards and you do not take these uh, thermal bridges into account, you have a, a cladding system, you do not thermally break them, that can can kill your certification easily because all these individual connectors, they add up to uh, a whole bunch of heat loss, potentially. So in this particular case, they put a little, it's probably hard to see, but they put a little uh, compressed plastic strip behind each and every connector that breaks the, um, the transfer sufficiently. And again, you can see here uh, with this little connector here, I, 
for some reason, I don't know why I don't have the, <laughs> um, the image that shows that, but uh, this is how it looks like if there's no thermal bridge um, interrupter behind it. So you have the cold being drawn into your wall quite significantly and that could lead to condensation. Uh, structural thermal bridging, we got those solutions as well. This is a, a product here, it's called a Fabrica. Um, in um, multifamily construction, you might have the situation where you have the thermal envelope and then you have a parking deck underneath. So uh, your structure has to penetrate through ambient air and um, you really can't have steel uh, go through from your insulated uh, envelope all the way uh, into the uh, ambient. So that needs to be thermally broken and that connector also has to be structural uh, and capable to take the load. Um, those, those products exist. Um, and of course, this is what Jeannie Gang should have done in Chicago. And uh, in all fairness to her, she actually did. That uh, uh, thermally broken connector here was actually specced in the aqua tower, but it got value engineered out of the building. So um, that would have been uh, a terrific solution right here and would have done the trick. Uh, it's, it's, it's a significant piece of engineering. It's not as trivial and easy as it looks. It's, not, it's a bit pricey. Uh, so you still have a cantilevering concrete balcony right here. And uh, the trick to the engineering is this little piece down here to, to take the compression uh, in that uh, kind of foam insulated space right here. And then this is a stainless steel rebar just for this portion because stainless has uh, less connectivity. So, um, and then mechanical systems, fairly simple, right? We have uh, the continuous uh, balanced ventilation with heat recovery or energy recovery. This is an example here again from one of the orchard projects. For low rise, centralized ventilation is okay. For three to four stories, we say you, you can do it. But if you get into bigger buildings, um, this is starting to create issues with the stack effect. So uh, for low rises, okay, this is a nice solution. In this particular case here is affordable, so they want the ventilation run in the background. They don't want to give people the option to turn it off. <laughs> um, so uh, there's, it's a great solution, and they uh, have uh, the ventilator here, and they also have, I'm not sure where exactly that is right now, but uh, there's an integrated heat pump in there. In that particular climate, the peak loads for heating and cooling are so low that an integrated um, heat pump can actually pr provide all the space conditioning to the spaces. So this is, this is the ideal scenario in that particular climate with that particular building typology. It doesn't always uh, happen that way, but there that works just like a charm. It's great. And uh, people are super happy. They, it's not getting too hot. And even Portland, Oregon now is getting 100 degree uh, days. So um, in New York City, what we see uh, preferably is like a ventilation system in each unit, especially if it's a condo building and you want the controls. Uh, you as the homeowner, you, you wanna make sure that, that you can actually adjust your ventilation yourself. And um, this is often then um, coupled with a, uh, with a centralized VRF variable, refrigerant flow, uh, heating and cooling system, which works very well for the large multifamily projects. Because sometimes you might need heating in one part of the building and sometimes cooling in the other at the same time. Um, this is a, a solution here. Uh, initially, so the ventilator best lives right next to the uh, wall assembly because uh, any duct from the ventilator to the exterior uh, envelope is essentially exterior envelope and is very prone to condensation and um, damage. And if there's a cut in, in the vapor uh, control layer around that duct, you will have water accumulate really quickly. It's a very touchy detail, so best to keep those ducts short. And then it's also best to keep the ventilation supply separate from the VRF, from the air handling uh, uh, for heating and cooling because they have different ventilation rates and they start to fight each other. This was the first draft right here by the um, designer and there the ventilator was still feeding into the supply from the VRF and we said, no, you, you better keep those separate. And in passive buildings, often you don't need heating or cooling, so you might just need ventilation. You, you, want, that, you want the ability to couple those. And this is just a single family, uh, everything decent, uh, decentralized essentially, like the, the um, heating and cooling system, the ventilation system, 
And uh, this could be also seen as basically a, a, a multifamily unit that keeps it all um, heating, cooling, and ventilation systems uh, with that one unit. And then, uh, okay, so this is for uh, when we get into uh, taller buildings. This is really what we would like to see for ventilation. Uh, have the per unit ventilator uh, installed and also compartmentalize the uh, apartments themselves. So if you, you basically neutralize the stack effect and create a neutral pressure plane in each apartment. So uh, stack effect no longer an issue. Uh, you still have to deal with the uh, elevator shaft and the um, staircases, but they get a separate ventilation system, pressurization, so on and so forth. But this is the ideal uh, solution right here for larger projects. Now, a secret to success that buildings actually perform the way you have designed them is actually very thorough quality assurance for design during the design process as well as during the construction process. Um, I think people underestimate how important that actually is. It, um, when we talk about passive buildings, it's really just a very, very well-performing, high-performance building. And it is actually energy engineering that we as the designers are performing. And if that design is not verified and validated, it might not perform as such. And um, we're designing the systems to be much smaller now. And if you're wrong, that could be a very costly proposition to fix. Uh, maybe OK for a single family home to experiment a little. But when it comes to like a 20 unit multifamily project, you as the designer, you don't want to have to be, you don't want to get this call that the system is undersized and uh, you're liable to fixing it. So uh, quality assurance, really important. And then after the building has been taken, uh, into operation. Uh, also very useful is a monitoring system that allows feedback for the people who are managing the project, they're running the project, and that keep commissioning the, the systems. Without these feedback loops, you can't find where the system is not working properly. Uh, trained professionals, that's uh, key to the success as well. And that's not just uh, designers, builders, and the verifiers on site, that's also students. We actually have a, a training curriculum for universities as well. And just as a side note, um, I was just in Golden, Colorado for the race to zero. I was a, one of the grand jurors. Uh, the two first projects uh, had used that curriculum, uh, the grand winner and the second runner up. So we're very happy that this is actually working in the academic environment as well. Uh, very quickly, I'm not sure how much time I, I've left. Um, a couple minutes. Maybe, maybe we just skip this. This is like a whole bunch of like feasibility studies. Uh, cool stuff. We calculated an all glass, high rise, residential tower. And turned out it was actually quite easy to meet our carbon targets and our um, energy targets. Uh, big difference was the windows and uh, the air tightness and uh, the hallway common lighting. That was the big, uh, big energy hawk in the whole thing. But that could be easily done today with um, technology that we have, we just have to have the, te the, the will to do it. Yeah? And uh, this is how we were able to crunch it down from basically what was the baseline was designed to meet code in Chicago. And after we were done, we were down here. So um, fairly easy, really, as far as we could tell. And here's, again, different way to show the reductions here. And I'm done. This is just a summary of what I just said, so skip this. Couple cool details for one of the first uh, core and shell um, projects that I can talk much more about, but hopefully we'll break ground in the fall in Chicago, high rise. Uh, much better detail, right? So this is like the process that the design team went through, like, okay, we have really crappy details, like how can we do this better? Came up with that one. Uh, we share all of our lessons learned on our uh, resource sites for commercial as well as for multifamily if you want to look that up on our website. And I really just quickly want to get to the next frontiers, just to the projects. Grid design is the next big question. How do we fit into the grid that's being updated, the grid that starts to be interactive, transactive? Um, we need to figure out how to instruct our consultants to design di direct current systems. We really want to go there. Um, maybe initially it's going to be a hybrid uh, solution, but we should and will get there hopefully. 
Um, passive buildings can take care of the duct curve. They can passively store over production in terms of like thermal storage. You can park over production in hot water heaters. Uh, and of course, there's the battery option. Tesla, very cute little thing. <laughs> Why do they make these sexy things? Um, so I'll, I'll show you, yeah, okay. This is uh, the 101 largest mid-rise right now in uh, Queens in the Rockaways. Uh, has a, a rooftop PV system, produces 25% of its own consumption. Uh, also an affordable project. And uh, this is really what I wanted to get to. So Next Frontiers, this is the first nanogrid project in the Mission District in San Francisco. If you ever are out there, definitely worth to visit. Um, first floor has four Teslas in it, uh, cars, and four Teslas as in batteries. Uh, each floor is one apartment, and each apartment owns a quarter of the canopy, which is PV. And uh, the project overproduces the baseline as Fierce Plus certified. Uh, and um, this is one of the first Fierce Plus so Zero projects, super cool. And uh, same is true for the Rocky Mountains headquarters in Basalt, also Fierce Plus so Zero certified and uh, also overproducing uh, fantastically, feeding a couple electric cars in the garage. And uh, I'd like to invite you all to join us for our 13th <laughs> annual uh, Pacifist Conference here in Boston in September. And with that, I'm done. And thanks to all of our partners uh, up here. Thank you. <laughs> Two minutes. Questions for Kat? Um, hi, great presentation. Uh, do you have any good designs for uh, insulating existing brick buildings? Yes, on the outside. On, only from the outside? <laughs> no, not only, but it becomes more difficult to do it on the inside. It, uh, of course it can be done. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for us, yeah, thank you. The use of thermal mass, especially for uh, cooling uh, purposes, and also the use of natural ventilation, because I see all the examples, the examples that you gave us, they all have uh, uh, artificial ventilation, but in the warmer climates, you can probably use just natural vent ventilation. Yes, absolutely. So, and, and all these projects, they are designed so that you can open windows and that you can use window ventilation. There, there are various reasons why projects can't do that. Uh, for example, the uh, affordable high-rise, they don't want to rely on, uh, on the occupants to do ventilation, so they don't even factor that into the energy balance. Uh, if you have a single family home, uh, always, always design for natural ventilation. Systems can always fail, right? So um, yes, you can open windows. And the other question, the first one was thermal the thermal mass. So very important for a cooling dominated climates and with that also for these big cooling internal load dominated um, multifamily projects. Thermal mass is very important for those. Uh, absolutely, it's very effective. Could you share why insulation works against you at a certain point in a cooling dominated climate? Yes. So imagine yourself uh, in Canada. Well, we don't have to go to Canada. We can do it here. Um, imagine yourself in a, what, what's the best uh, skiing jacket that you can think of? Um, like best quality? I, yeah, North Company, like whatever, like, uh, I don't know, North Face. Or, uh, imagine Climate Zone 8. And you wear that thing on Times Square in July. And you cannot take that thing off. How do you think you feel? Does that make sense? So the, the thing is, is like you always have internal loads. And, and they are always there. In the winter, they work for you. Great. They heat your house. But in the summer, for the cooling purpose, you're starting behind of the, the starting line, right? Like the, this is always a liability. So you, you want to find that right spot between gains and losses, and you want to optimize that. 
It's hard. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me because if your exterior temperature is higher than the, the temperature that you're conditioning to inside, then if you were if you were having like a, a cooling system inside of your pocket, yeah, it might work. Well, you know, your house, your out by temperature. Maybe it gets down to 100, and you know the inside would be 70 or 75. You would insulate it, so just like your whole south wall is 15 inches slip panels. You could do that, but then don't produce any heat inside of the building. But you live in the building, right? The, the ex <laughs> and, and the exchanger, the, the heat exchanger, again, is not 100% efficient, so it will always warm your building. It, it, it's, it's, it's complex, but... Um, is the problem that you have a dishwasher and a blender and you've got stuff in your house that you're using that generates heat? Yeah, and people. And, and if you have daughters, you're really like in bad shape. Yeah. So this was very interesting uh, in terms of what can be done, and I, it was fabulously presented. But I have a question on once you're in the use phase, what is the expected lifetime of these buildings? How long are they being designed to last? And how do you think about that moving forward? So they, they are essentially designed to last uh, at least 70 years, if not 100. <laughs> um, in our original cost optimization, we were very conservative, and we only calculated with 30 years for the cost um, optimization. But then for the second, for the 2018, now we've upped this to 70 because there are studies out there that are pretty believably make, making the case that buildings last on average for about 70 years. Yeah. I was just wondering about creative ways people are handling the dehumidification or what's typical and then is there anything kind of on the forefront to do dehumidification? So dehumidification is a really interesting one um, for m many different reasons. But just, just imagine uh, yourself in a single family home in like whatever, let's, let's go to Austin or something. Uh, you, you crush the sensible cooling, uh, but your uh, latent cooling for the, the humidity uh, demand is still the same. Uh, you, you can do a little bit with like an ERV and re rejecting it. But the problem is that now latent cooling and dehumidification are very close together. And that your cooling system, if you did it right, it shouldn't really run much. So there's not enough sensible cooling that can remove the humidity that you want to remove. So we really need to um, separate those two functions. And there's really no off the shelf system there. And, and a lot of uh, teams are struggling with this, and it's very frustrating. Uh, it's not that the technology is not there and that people are not thinking of it. They just haven't really packaged it and put it on the shelf for passive building designers to readily use. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Have you used clay walls to absorb the humidity? Uh, no, uh, I personally have not, but yes. Uh, so uh, the modeling tool that I showed you, the uh, Wolfie Plus tool, that can actually model the impact of a uh, material that can hold moisture on the energy balance. It's very cool. It's so fine-grained, so uh, it, it's a good idea. But now we even have a tool that can actually put a number on it. Well, if there are no other questions, one more. Karen, could you, you, you know, I just encourage you to finish so you blurred through the one slide that said transactive on it and, and that, I mean, in terms of how you see these buildings interacting with, with, with grids or power purchases or prosumer sorts of things, could you say just a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, we, we are thinking about um, developing an aspect of the standard that rates buildings based on, we, um, we called it a flexibility factor. So ba based on um, how it passively could 
start to take care of this overproduction um, to be able to assess that ability. Uh, it's really just something that we're just wrapping our head around, like how, what are the elements that these passive buildings, these low energy buildings, how can they benefit the grid? How can we quantify it? And how can we then learn from it and, and design the new grid with that in mind? Mm -hmm. If we don't know that, then we can't design the new grid with that in mind. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. I had, well, I had kind of a continuation of the question uh, for the natural ventilation, um, because I was curious to know how are you trying to address that, especially in this, when developing standards and codes. I imagine that you've shown some high-rise buildings in which to make the standards work really well, you have to control the neutral plane by floors and to <coughs> deal with elevators and staircases. Um, so if people just hope you can give the open uh, the open windows option to people that's obviously going to throw the building out of balance especially in certain climates and especially if you're pushing a very sensitive target like very low so how do you deal with that complexity when try to regulate and when try to tell people what they can or they cannot do to get the certification does that make sense kind of the yeah so um I, so the, the the compartmentalization of the apartment should actually be a bulwark against that, right? So the the apartment itself becomes airtight, and then you can open the window, and you're not causing any problem for if you open it on the bottom, somebody on top. Uh, so so that's essentially a measure to counteract that. Um, that's that's the best I can answer that. I think I, we encourage natural ventilation. We do because that's a good strategy to yeah. bring the energy down. We just don't calculate it into the energy balance because we can't trust the occupant to behave as we thought they would in the model. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, let's thank uh, Pat again for.